Okay, I, I could probably, I could probably project without the microphone, but we have folks online, so I, I need to use the microphone so that it so that it streams. Uh, my name's first of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name's Charles. Uh, I work at a company called Temporal. Uh, we'll talk a bit about Temporal as part of this talk. Um, I'm really grateful to uh, Global for hosting us. Um, uh, we uh, we're a company that makes software for other software developers, and so it's a big opportunity for us to to speak to a whole audience of, of uh, the developer community in Barcelona. So thank you for having us. Um, I'm gonna uh, give a talk that's gonna last about 45 minutes uh, and share a bunch of things about uh, what, what it is we do and, and, and sort of where we think software development's going. Um, and then uh, my colleague, Mael, is gonna give a demo just to make it a little more real. And then we'll have time for a discussion. So I think all the talking that uh, Mael and me will do will take you know, less than an hour and uh, then look forward to um, having a discussion with, with all of you. Um, when uh, we advertised this meetup, I think it, the title was something like uh, fault tolerant distributed cloud applications with temporal and then it turned into microservices with temporal or something like this. And these are accurate uh, ways of describing what I'm going to talk about, but uh, I wanted to uh, uh, get your attention, and uh, and and so this is the the title I want to use practically for this talk, which is why durable execution changes everything. And we'll see if I can convince you that that's true by the time the hour is done. Um, I have uh, been working in software for about 20 years, so uh, almost always in software product companies. And uh, I love the industry, I love working with software, and I love learning about the history of it too and kind of where it came from and you know, what, why the cha what's changed and why it changed the way it did. Um, and, and that's why I feel like I, I can say something like this changes everything with some confidence is because I feel like I have a little bit of a sense for, uh, for, for the history that came before. Um, and uh, one of the things if I were to generalize about software, if I said, what's the story of software? Uh, I think one of the big, uh, big uh, uh, elements or, or themes in the story of software is the story of more. Uh, that however much software we have, people always want more software. Uh, and uh, you know, famously, I think um, Mark Andreessen said software is eating the world, but even when software eats the world, software kind of gets bigger and bigger and bigger, even for the things that it ate. Uh, and so this is this nifty, you can't read the individual words, but this is a neat infographic, which is, uh, the number of uh, lines of code in the code base for uh, different well-known uh, uh, platforms and applications. And uh, uh, what you can see is that essentially over the course of time, uh, the code base, uh, the size of code bases for any software that we use in our daily lives has grown by um, orders of magnitude. And uh, these little gray arcs you see here, those are connections between two different versions of the same product. So for example, on that far left there, uh, the original uh, Adobe Photoshop was about 100,000 lines of code. Uh, and then uh, by the time you got to Photoshop 6, it was, it was something like 60 million lines of code or something like this. Um, there's actually like one missing from this infographic, which is Google, which I think they estimated to be something like 20 billion lines of code. So the, the story of software is that we always want more. Uh, and we want more because we want more features, we want more functions, we want more parts of our life to be automated. Uh, we want better experience and all this, all this winds up being more code. Um, and uh, the, the interesting bit of course, and we know this if we've worked in, in, in engineering for any point in time, any, any length of time, is that while we all want more code, we want more software, uh, we also know that um, more engineers does not automatically mean more software. Uh, and in fact, if you, if you do it wrong, uh, more engineers means less software. Uh, and there's a, there's a famous, you know, this classic book, The Mythical Man Month, which described this very accurately. Uh, and there's a, they called this problem uh, the Mongolian horde problem, right? That if you have a Mongolian horde of engineers, you will probably wind up with less software than, than uh, you did before. So we want more software, but we can't have the Mongolian horde uh, uh, to get our software. So what is it we're going to do to get more? Um, and the answer uh, that we've come up with over time has been modularity. And modularity is our way of getting more engineers to actually get us more software. 
And uh, we've had all kinds of versions of modularity over the years. But what really kicked uh, the, the goal of uh, the, the, the uh, design principle of modularity into overdrive uh, was cloud infrastructure and cloud architectures. You know, it's not like modularity wasn't a good idea before, but modularity got uh, drastically accelerated um, by the availability of uh, cloud, cloud infrastructure. So because we had containers, because we had platform as a service, because we had um, uh, flexible, uh, 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 programmable infrastructure, uh, all of a sudden it was possible to have uh, teams function in more and more independent modules that were more and more autonomous from one another with less likelihood of breaking one another. And uh, this all seems great. Um, uh, the idea was that we could uh, get to a, a much greater level of modularity and reuse. That meant we were gonna have more software. It meant that we were gonna be able to uh, scale uh, different pieces of a larger code base independently from each other. And that seemed like a good idea to get more software. And uh, most importantly, the promise was speed, that uh, the way to get more software is to have a high rate of iteration. And in fact, I was talking to some global colleagues earlier today, and they were saying that that, that goal of speed was something that was uh, part of the designed into the culture of the company from very early on, which makes perfect sense. So the idea was, okay, we're going to be, we're going to use this infrastructure. It's going to make us more modular and more loosely coupled than ever before. And as a result, we're going to get modularity, high rate of iteration, uh, independent scaling. And this idea of a two pizza team, right? That like no team needs to be bigger than what can be fed by two pizzas. And that way, the number of, you know, connections and communication and interaction between people is never too complicated. And this is awesome. Now we can, as long as we can hire more engineers, we can have more, we can have more software. That was sort of the, the idea. And we've been kind of living in, in this, we've been going through this progression for the last 10 years or so. And um, what I want to convince you of is that while that's partially true, it's also partially a trap. Um, that this is not as simple uh, as, as it's made out to be. And that's why durable execution is going to change everything. Um, because what happened is, as we, uh, as we allowed people to run their own uh, uh, portions of, the, of, their, of a code base independently from one another, what we wound up doing is taking more and more software developers and turning them into distributed systems developers without telling them. And uh, I, I've spent more than 10 years in distributed systems. And in, in my experience from this compared to before is that the rules completely change. As soon as you become distributed, uh, the concerns that you have to deal with uh, are completely different than the concerns you had to deal with before. And um, this has always been true. In fact, this, this, these eight principles of, of um, or fallacies of distributed systems, have, this was written back in the, in the 90s. Um, but almost nobody needed to understand this idea. Uh, and then, you know, about you know, when I was working on uh, uh, distributed systems like Cloudera, okay, well, we had to understand that idea because it was central to the way everything was designed. Um, but what's, what's important to know now is that application development has been thrust into the middle uh, of this complexity um, and this difficulty. And um, probably most people, when they're working in an uh, application that's comprised of lots of modules or services, don't think of it in these terms. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why, especially, is because um, we have these, these architects, and they gave us this great sense of confidence uh, in the way this is supposed to work. And they said, yes, that's true. Yes, it's true that now all of you are gonna develop uh, your uh, features or services independently from each other. And yes, it's true that they talk to each other over a network. And I'm sure you have a bunch of questions as to like all how this is all gonna hang together, but don't worry. I've got this picture that says it's all gonna be great. And the picture says that we're all gonna be event driven. And all you've got to do, you don't need to worry about like all these fallacies of distributed systems. Now nah, that's not a problem. All you have to do is write your feature or function or service, and then just have a talk to a queue. And, and then you're going to be event driven. And then there's going to be this beautiful kind of emergent behavior that you get. And all of a sudden, you don't need to understand what's going on uh, with your neighbors uh, and what they've implemented, because you just kind of listen to a queue or push to a queue, and the rest will take care of itself. Uh, and look how easy this is. Like it looks like this very elegant uh, choreographed uh, little like you know ice capade between different services. 
and uh, how could how could this how can this go wrong? Um, but as is always the case, uh, if you're if you're an engineer, you know that the picture is is never the reality, and that's been more true uh, uh, in this time than uh, it has in uh, a long time. So what really happens is is that at an architectural level, we 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 say, ah, oh, we have this simple picture that explains the way it's all going to work. And then you face the reality. And the reality is that the engineering, the engineers that uh, build functionality, business logic, build the back end, that's the, the, the lifeblood of any, of any software, they are the ones that are paying the price uh, uh, for, for this uh, kind of simple view of the world. Um, so let me give you an example. So um, this is uh, uh, a kind of very basic uh, example of a money transfer. Um, from one bank to another. And because uh, the bank's got some system that, uh, that you talk to to withdraw money, and uh, the banks, there's a different bank with a different system that you use to credit money, uh, we have this, this is only uh, whatever, uh, five lines of code, and we already have our first distributed application, right? So we're going to withdraw from one place and we're going to deposit to another place. So, okay, that's not so bad. I mean, if, if for, for, for engineering, if this is all you have to do to move money in an application, like this is a pretty, a pretty straightforward exercise. But as I mentioned, we're distributed. So let's see, let's see if this works in practice. Well, the, um, the first challenge uh, when you think about the implementation is uh, when you withdraw money, uh, it could be the case that uh, the moment that you, the program is withdrawing money, the network uh, is uh, 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 down or, or has high latency. And so you try to withdraw money and you don't successfully withdraw money. Or maybe the service you talk to, the bank you talk to, uh, doesn't talk back to you for some reason. Maybe they're overloaded. Uh, maybe there's a bug on their end. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe there's an incorrect implementation. Could be any of these things. So uh, you say, okay, well, I, I, need, I can't have to monitor this every time we withdraw money or else what's the point of writing the software? So I'm gonna build retries then. So now every time I call this bank and I ask to withdraw money, I'm gonna add this additional logic, uh, this additional code to my code base that's gonna say, well, okay, when I withdraw money, let's make sure that we retry it until we succeed. Okay, wonderful. So, okay, life got a little bit harder as a developer, but you know, hardly, uh, hardly too much. Ah, uh, but wait, I have to do this for the deposit too. So let's go, okay, fine, more retries. Let's go build another, add another piece to our code, which is now when I deposit money, I have to make sure that that happens successfully. So let's have a bunch of additional logic uh, uh, to, to make sure that we can deposit successfully. At this point, we've roughly you know, tripled our code base just to make this, this one feature work. Uh, and then you say, oh, wait, but the problem is I kind of, if you look at the retries as they're expressed here, they're pretty naively done. Uh, so what happens if I withdraw several times uh, accidentally when I do retries, because maybe one eventually goes through? That's probably not good. I think I could go to jail if I take money too many times. Uh, and you say, well, then again, what if I deposit too many times? Well, that's not good. I'll probably go broke if I give away too much money. So now uh, I need to also check to make sure that I only withdrew once and that I only deposited once after all the retries were done. So now if I, if I did more than once in either situation, I need to do these compensations. I need to do these ways of unwinding the thing that I did twice that I didn't mean to do twice. And now the code base is probably you know eight times the size of where we started. Um, and then go further from here, and now let's add in timeouts for you know kind of other failure modes. And now we've successfully 10x the code base. So essentially, what we've done uh, as we've moved into this new world is we've taken all the complexity of people and we've turned it into the complexity. Uh, we, we've, we've basically just moved that complexity into our code. Um, and so now, like uh, one feature is ballooned as we have to factor in all these different considerations. Uh, because we said we wanted to be modular, and in order to be modular, we wound up being distributed. And so, on the one hand, we we you know we 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 are capturing some of those possibilities of faster iteration and independent scaling, but uh, we're paying a price. And the price comes in the fact that now, uh, you with these new concerns, the software that we write today has is become oftentimes much less reliable to run than it used to be because the number of moving parts in the system increases the chance of intermittent failure. Um, we've also become much less uh, productive 
um, to write new features because there's however many lines of code for the business logic. And then there's all the other surrounding lines of code, which are really more failure handling and, and, and fault tolerance and these, and these kinds of things. And the other thing you'll notice, by the way, if you go back to that previous example, is that it's very difficult to even distinguish where your, your business logic is relative to your failure handling. And so later on, if you want to change your business logic, um, working your way through that when it's so intertwined with your fa failure handling, you've sort of lost separation of concerns uh, in, this, in this case. Um, and, then, and then the other uh, big, big challenge with, that we've wound up with now is that the uh, diagnose the ability to diagnose and operate these applications is uh, much more challenging because now it's increasingly likely that you have features uh, or collections of features that are written in different languages, uh, uh, in processes that log differently uh, and have their own um, idiosyncrasies. And uh, all of this now, when something goes wrong, uh, you know, your typical uh, DevOps person is gonna have a very difficult time understanding uh, uh, what to fix and how to fix it. And so you wind up using uh, much, much more uh, uh, expensive people uh, to do what used to be simple things. So this is the situation that we found ourselves in. Um, and uh, Temporal, uh, where I work, uh, is, uh, was created to solve these challenges. Um, and if you say, what is Temporal as a technology? Um, Temporal is uh, what, I, what we call a uh, durable execution system. Um, you say, well, okay, what do you mean by that? You've said this durable execution thing twice. So what's, what's, what's exactly the, the premise? Um, the idea is, let's kind of break down each one. So the idea of temporal um, and, and, and other technologies like it is that a durable execution system is one that um, guarantees uh, uh, the, uh, from an, sorry, from an execution point of view, guarantees the successful and correct uh, execution of any feature or function that's running. Um, so the idea being that all of these kind of failure modes that you saw in the previous example, those responsibilities are absorbed um, by, by, by the system as opposed to by the, by the, um, the code, um, uh, the failure handling code that you had to implement. Um, it's durable, meaning that uh, part of how uh, uh, the feature or function that you write gets its resilience is because every execution uh, written in a system like this is uh, written down, written to a kind of a ledger. And essentially, it's not even just the execution that's written down, it's everything that happens before the execution, at the execution, and after the execution. And this winds up giving us all kinds of nice advantages in terms of how our code uh, will run in real life. And the principal advantage is being uh, that um, because every execution is recorded, it does wonders for recoverability. Because if you have some kind of uh, failure, it doesn't matter how catastrophic the failure is. Um, whenever you recover, you can get back to, uh, well, most failures you can just automatically roll over and, and, and recover, which I'll get into an example in a minute. But even if you have a catastrophic failure, like let's say losing an entire region or something like really dramatic like this, as soon as you come back, you know exactly where the state was of the execution of every function that you wrote in this model. Uh, and so you can replay back to the exact place where you were. The second big advantage to making things durable uh, is uh, replayability. So if you're looking to uh, fix something, uh, de debug something, troubleshoot something, uh, uh, you get the ability to basically uh, rerun past execution and get back to the exact point in code, in the code where uh, the the failure might have started from, if it's a, if it's an error in the code. Um, and the third big advantage uh, to uh, being durable is correctness. So if I have like a larger service or application, and that's comprised of uh, services or processes that are running independently from each other, um, you want this, the whole application or service to be in a consistent state. Well, because all of the features or functions connected to it were durable, you can always piece together the correct, you can always get back to the correct state for the whole thing. So you never wind up in an incorrect state. So durability winds up being um, a, really, uh, a really attractive thing for, uh, for any feature that you write. And then uh, the last thing is it's a system. Um, it's a system that abstracts away 
Um, uh, it's a system that abstracts away the infrastructure that you need to live in a distributed world as a developer. So if you think about um, building features today, uh, it's if, if you're in the back end, typically you might, of course you have, um, you might have some, you have some database you interact with, with persistence, but then you also have perhaps some queue you interact with to publish something to. And that requires that maybe you also honor some uh, event schema uh, for whatever you're gonna publish to that queue or parse some event schema for whatever you're gonna read from that queue. Uh, maybe you've got some cache, some load balance or you know, these kinds of things. And all, all that infrastructure is surfaced to the developer, even though most of those things are not really like the, the home base for that developer. So the idea of making this a, a generic system is that all that underlying infrastructure exists, but it's nicely abstracted away from the developer. And you can think of all that, 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 that infrastructure as something that just gets dynamically allocated to the business logic that you implement, as opposed to something that you have to explicitly deal with and, and think about all the com operational complexities of working with these platforms. So, okay, how does that work in practice? Um, the basic idea of the way uh, a durable execution system works is that there is the way that you write your software and there's the way that you, uh, and then there's the way then that that software runs when it's, when it's compiled or interpreted. So um, the cool bit about durable execution is that it does not uh, change the core, um, core developer uh, work. It doesn't change the, the day in the life of building, uh, writing new code. So you write, you write in code, same as you always did. Um, all kinds of different languages are supported. It's not specific to, doesn't, well, it's not all languages, but it's many popular languages and there's no reason why there couldn't be more in the future. So it's not, it's not uh, specific to any one language. And there is one thing different. If you look at this code, this is an example of a temporal feature. And you'll see these references there to uh, workflows, which is sleep duration of day is 30. And you'll see these references to activities. Um, and so essentially what the, what the system, the platform provides, what the system provides is a set of primitives. And so you write the same code you always wrote, but you organize that code into uh, one of a handful of concepts. And in the case of Temporal, there's roughly five, but the most notable two are workflows and activities. The vast majority of what, you can build a whole feature or service using just workflows and activities, you know, just depending on the, the thing that you're building. There's a handful of others. So think of those, those primitives or those metaphors as something like a way of organizing your business logic, right? But that you'll notice that everything else that you're looking, here, uh, looking at here is really just the business logic. You'll see that there's no, like this is one of the things that uh, uh, um, said, uh, I, I remember from a discussion is that most of the time when you see a sample or a demo, like on a, on a video or what have you, they show you this amount, the simple stuff that's like expresses the logic and everybody knows, well, if I did this in real life, you know, I would have to build all this other surrounding code uh, to make this work in real life. That's not the case here. This is it. There is no other code but this. This is the implementation. So all that extraneous um, uh, uh, failure handling logic is not there. Why is that true? Well, we did, we did ask this one thing. We asked you to kind of organize your logic into, into these metaphors. Um, then when you're, uh, when you're done implementing uh, your code uh, and it runs as a process, that process then calls the other part of the system, which is the server. And the process says, hey, I'm this process or this piece of this functionality that was built as part of a durable execution system. What should I do today? And the server says, I'm glad you asked and begins to, actually, I'll show you in a second, begins to basically um, drive the execution of that software. And um, in doing so, what happens is that running process inherits all of the properties you need to succeed as a distributed feature. So things like routing, sharding, consensus, queuing, load balancing, all that infrastructure that you kind of deal with piece parts independently today, that's all essentially kind of inherited as long as you bought into this, uh, this implementation that you saw on the left-hand side. And so in this way, we try, to take, uh, we try to take the most simple part of what you do in engineering and leave it that way, keep it simple, and then take all the tricky and complicated parts and abstract it away into this model. So practically speaking, this is kind of what it actually, how it actually lays out in real life. Um, essentially, all of the, the code that I showed you before, let's assume it's compiled. Um, when it's compiled, it basically runs as what we call a worker. 
in, in, in our lingo. And there's workers for workflows and workers for activities. These are stateless. You can, you can run as many of them as you like. You can run at any scale that you like. You can have as, you know, so, so there's no real limit to what you can do there. Um, and you can deploy it the same way you do everything else. So this is what's one of the really nifty bits about the way this, this kind of system works is that um, you deploy it to the same target you always do. You run it in the same place you always do. That means that um, you can get all of these advantages without having to make changes to uh, your CI CD pipelines or the other web frameworks you might use or uh, the, way you do the way you do testing. All of these kinds of things are essentially uh, st stay the same um, when you live in this world. And the reason why that's possible is because it's this kind of all code uh, based, um, based experience. And then essentially really what's happening is that process winds up calling the server. Um, that server has all these uh, distributed um, uh, infrastructure bits inside of it, but all uh, your code sees or the process that's running now sees is a flow of events to and fro. And essentially the server winds up driving the execution of your code and ensuring that it executes correctly and reliably, but does not without dictating where your code ran or how your code ran. And that's sort of the nifty idea is that you can get all of these uh, gains with very little change. Um, the way this is made possible is really from uh, uh, two big uh, innovations, which are what uh, kind of unlock um, the, the, the advantages that I was describing. So the first is the idea of, a, of this programming model. The idea that you can come up with this kind of abstraction that asks a small amount from the developer, which is basically to buy into these, these metaphors of workflows and activities. But in doing that, basically successfully abstracts away all the details of topics and, and event schemas and partitions and uh, uh, caches and shards and all and uh, SLO differences and all that kind of infrastructure that kind of seeps into software engineering. We basically put that back down in the basement um, because this programming model essentially manages to abstract it away. Um, and then the other big innovation is the idea that really what's going on in the covers, what makes the code durable is that every execution of the code lives on this transactional event loop. And, uh, and, that, and that event loop is like this ledger that you can always go back to. And that's what, buy, that's what gives you your replayability, your recoverability, your correctness. All those things are essentially a function of the fact that you can, you can live on this durable ledger. And so essentially, uh, any feature that you implement with the durable execution system inherits these properties. Um, and that means that your features become durable, fault tolerant, and consistent, which are all pretty important. Uh, and then on top of that, it also improves testability and operability. So what's the, what's the, what's the point of all that? I mean, essentially what it does, if you, let, if you bring it up a level, is it means that uh, services or applications you build this way run much more reliably. So the failure rate you experience any given day, week, or month will drop by you know, probably an order of magnitude, typically. Um, and uh, then uh, you become much more productive uh, in terms of enhancing. You see the number of lines of code that collapse. And also the idea that you, you, you wind up seeing that like business logic becomes like its own, like it basically uh, almost like compacts and brings you back to just the core business logic. So it's actually like easier to read and interpret. Um, and then uh, much more operable. So um, if you think about the way you monitor like a normal service or application, you might think of it as like a series of layers, like, you know, front end, middle tier, you know, persistence, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, and that's all great. That's all visibility you still need. But what you're able to do uh, with Temporal or with the durable execution system is um, actually see every execution uh, as it's running through the service or, or feature or product. And uh, that's a level of visibility that's difficult to get um, with just tr tracing libraries and, and things like this. Um, and these are all quotes from uh, real world uh, users, um, uh, Snap and Checker and, and Descript and their practical experience uh, using this. So where, where, would, um, where would this make sense to apply? And uh, if you kind of gathered from here, essentially you could apply it Almost anywhere, anything, anything that's kind of back end and, and has any any amount of uh, uh, state 
is, is probably uh, a good candidate. And uh, where, do, where do we actually see it the most in practice? Um, these are kind of the four most common service and application patterns that we see where folks use this type of, uh, this type of system. So the first is uh, transaction processing. So, you know, I showed you that money movement example at the beginning, that's a kind of a version of transaction processing. Um, and what we see uh, these days is that really that money movement, the, the business logic of that money movement is oversimplified. Uh, there's many other twists and turns to what you really do when you move money, like maybe you check for fraud, uh, maybe, maybe you make sure someone has sufficient balance and so on. Um, and so, uh, and then you need all of these things to execute all together or none at all. Um, so transaction processing winds up being a popular use of this. The second big one is more for like business process applications. So that could be something like order management. That could be something like account onboarding. Uh, that could be something like mortgage origination. So these are all things that are like long lived, fairly complex processes, and they have lots of variability in them, right? They don't all behave the same way all the time. Um, partly because they touch so many different services and partly because they deal with users and users don't always do what you want them to do. Um, and so you get tons of variance from this. And so business process application, and so rolling over that variance and having something that stays uh, fault tolerant and reliable is pretty valuable. Um, third big area you see this is infrastructure applications. So this could be um, data pipelines, but I think the kind of better, the, an even better example is someone will build like uh, an infrastructure service, right? So let's say you have a, um, some kind of landscape and you want your engineering team to like be able to auto provision their own uh, landscape to run something. And it's got lots of different infrastructure services inside of it. Um, well, if you've worked with Amazon and tried to program against Amazon, you know that it does, or any cloud, um, it, it, you, know, you can program against them, it works, but they don't always, the services don't all do exactly what you want them to do, exactly when you want them to do those things. And so being able to program this um, as a durable execution allows you to do something like generate a complete landscape and not worry that you know, the, the web server came up before the database or something like this. Um, and then the other place where you see these is um, there are higher level platforms and tools that are more like low code, no code or domain specific um, uh, types of development environments. But then whatever you build with those needs to, needs to execute reliably and those get implemented because the programming model is so expressive. You can basically implement anything as arbitrarily sophisticated as you can implement in any programming language. So you can basically um, use uh, a, a system like Temporal as the, as the basis for domain-specific developer platforms. Um, some of you, uh, if, if these are problems, the, the problems I've been describing before, if these are familiar to you, uh, then it means you might have heard of other possible answers to like how you're supposed to solve for this. And the most kind of generic way I could describe these is to say it's patterns. That you know, when someone says, "Hey, how am I supposed to handle the fact that you know I need to uh, uh, account for all these failures, or I'm worried about winding up in an inconsistent state, or I'm calling something over a network that has latency, or there's all this user variability?" What you the the, the alternative solution prior to technology like Temporal oftentimes was some kind of an architectural pattern, and you'll hear uh, uh, phrases or concepts like. Uh, reservation patterns or circuit breaker patterns or transactional outbox, or there's you know, many, many others, or maybe it's just some state machine somebody built internally, right? But all of these are basically like software frameworks that are trying to, to deal with a specific failure mode or consistency, a failure of consistency that you're worried about. Um, so this is not a crazy idea. And in a, in a limited set of situations, these kinds of patterns do work. Um, so it's not to say that this is like complete fallacy, but the, there's, there's two big challenges with this approach. Um, the, 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 main, the main issue is uh, each of these patterns is really targeting one failure mode. So if you build a broad uh, a service or, or application with a lot of features, you're going to wind up having to learn most of these, not just one or two of these. Um, the second challenge with these is that 
in order for other developers and the team to take advantage of them, each one of these patterns exposes a programming model, right? Exposes like it's a framework or an API or something that you need to learn as a developer and interact with. And what you find with a lot of these is then that they're not all available in all the same languages. And so now you cater to some developers, but not others. And the third issue is these things still run on uh, uh, all that same kind of infrastructure I was talking about before. Most of these patterns require that you implement them on top of a database and a queue using a cache or a load balancer. And most of these patterns wind up leaking uh, all of that infrastructure um, uh, uh, complexity to, to the developer. So um, it works in narrow, so these things work in narrow circumstances, but as the, the bigger and broader your feature set gets, um, the, the less and less likely they're going to work, or the more diverse your developer population gets, the less likely they're to work. And they're actually more, they're every bit as uh, infrastructure intensive and more complicated to work with. The other, um, uh, the other alternative that you'll see sometimes is folks will say, ah, well, there's these other tools I've seen, and they're like orchestration tools. And isn't that really what we need? We need orchestration. Charles, you're just kind of making this argument that choreography is, is not, is not uh, sustainable. And if we just use some other kind of an orchestration tool, some kind of a um, you know, configurable drag and drop way of orchestrating services or something like this, we'll, we'll, we'll solve the problem that way. Um, and back in the day, these would have been called BPMN uh, tools. In more recent times, these would be uh, orchestration tools that give you some template, like that's maybe JSON or YAML or you know XML or something like this to kind of express the orchestration that you want. Um, or maybe it's a visual palette, you're supposed to be able to drag and drop this. And then this is gonna drive your, your execution. So on the, on, to, on the positive side, these things do actually drive the execution of software, software functions. So to its credit, they do that. But that's about the only good thing that I can say, because the big challenge with all of these is that you are, is the fact that they're not based in code. So because these are based on either visual palettes or based on uh, 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 templates like JSON or YAML kind of domain specific templates, you have kind of two big drawbacks from that. Um, the first is that it becomes a lot less pleasant to use as a developer. Right, because the whole point of you know being a developer is that you're most comfortable in code, and so now you're going to be coding most of the time, uh, but then you're going to have to drop out of coding uh, and uh, learn how to uh, just type into some JSON feel, uh, JSON form or YAML form to basically express the orchestration that you want. Now, someone will say, "Well, that's not really true. We can have language bindings, and then you can just kind of uh, you you feel like more like you're programming." That's not entirely honest because really what happens is you have language bindings that just generate the YAML file or you have language bindings that just generate the uh, JSON file. And the reason why that's problematic is for purposes, like I said before, the advantage of code based is your deployment decisions, your build decisions, your versioning decisions, your, uh, your testing decisions are all based on a software development process that you've spent years optimizing. And as soon as you go into some, some other kind of system where it says, feed me this file and I'll do the rest. You've decoupled this piece of your implementation from your traditional test and build processes. You need to run some separate flow to handle this. And you need to hope that this, this way of doing development is as robust as the software development lifecycle that you've already created. And the odds that it are, are basically zero. Um, okay, a little bit more about temporal. Um, uh, I, you know, believe that we are kind of the leading uh, developer and provider of um, a durable execution system. Um, and we have the uh, largest open source user community um, that I'm aware of. Um, and the thing to, that's interesting about Temporal is uh, the origin of this technology. The, the company Temporal is only three years old, um, but the origin of this technology is more like uh, 10 years old, 12 years old, actually. And not surprisingly, it dates all the way back to the beginning of cloud services in the first place. So uh, the very first um, work that uh, Maxime, the co-founder and, and CEO of, of Temporal did when he was at Amazon was help build uh, what eventually beca uh, became uh, uh, SQS, Simple Queuing Service. So way back before there was an Amazon Web Services when there was just Amazon, Amazon, 
they wanted to break up their own monolith because their code base was getting too big and they were dealing with all this complexity. And they said, no more monolith. Everything's going to be separate. Everything's going to be APIs. Everyone's going to talk to each other over APIs. And they had the same challenges with complexity and unreliability. And so they did an initial implementation that was SQS that was used internally at Amazon. And then when Amazon Web Services launched, it started with SQS. So this was actually the very first platform service uh, that, that ever um, uh, uh, that Amazon ever ever provided, but this was not a durable execution system. Um, then there was a second generation that got built uh, at Amazon uh, by Maxime and now Samar, the other co-founder of Temporal, um, and that was called SWF or Simple Workflow, and that was really like the very first generation of what we have today. Um, so they worked on this for a number of years. This is something that's still available at AWS. You can check it out yourself if you like. Um, and uh, that was the first time that there was an all code way of getting durable execution that I'm aware of. Um, I don't think, yeah, I don't think there's any implementation I've seen prior to this. And that's continued to use to this day. Uh, Samara went on to work at Microsoft where he built another version of this still. Uh, this time it was called Durable Task Framework, but same idea. Um, and it made some, you know, made, it evolved the programming model a bit. Then uh, Max and Samar wound up working together at Uber, where they built a system called Cadence. And Cadence was really taking uh, a lot of the ideas uh, that they had and experiences they had had with SWF and Task Framework, Durable Task Framework, and saying, all right, how do we make the programming model um, you know, the abstraction, you know, cleaner and better and able to handle, you know, an even wider range uh, of features and applications and how do we make it scale better and all kinds of other good things like that. Cadence is used extensively at Uber um, and was open sourced. And this got popular enough that uh, Maxime and Samar said, yeah, you know what, we should, we should make this a company and we should make this something that everybody can use. Um, and uh, that was what created uh, Temporal. And when Temporal was founded, we ba they basically created the Temporal Open Source Project. And you can think of this as kind of like a successor project to Cadence that they built to sort of serve the broader, the kind of world, the global developer community, as opposed to kind of principally serving uh, Uber's, you know, Uber's roadmap and, and requirements. So um, Temporal has been around as an open source project now for three years. Um, uh, our user, uh, the number of developers that use it um, each, each, uh, each week is coming up in about 100,000, give or take. Um, and it's growing very quickly. Um, and the company itself is you know, well-funded and all the, all the good things that you, you, know, you wanna hear about, about startups. Um, part of why I think Temporal is, so, is one of the more uh, popular uh, ways to, probably the most popular way for, to, to do durable execution is it's a very rich and complete feature set. So it's an open source platform that's been evolved over more than uh, six years at this point. Um, so it has been proven at really, really, really uh, high scale because Uber, Uber run, ran at high scale. Um, and now that it's getting used by many other hyperscale companies, uh, it continues to get stretched and matured in all kinds of exciting ways. So um, it has a lot of production use already. Um, it has a very rich feature set, whether it be the number of languages supported or the degree to which we've thought through um, the operations requirements, like you know, how do you deal with versioning? How do you deal with monitoring? How do you deal with operations? A lot of those details have been worked out. Um, so quite quite uh, successful in this regard. And uh, the platform itself has all kinds of nice properties. Um, it's open source under an MIT license. We don't do dual license or you know, GPL or anything, anything exotic like that. Um, it has really, really um, uh, excellent scale. So we have applications today that generate tens of billions of executions a day successfully for a single instance. Um, it's got all kinds of nifty security properties. It's got great availability properties. It already runs in a multi-tenant way. Uh, and um, it's also extensible in all kinds of ways. And if you look at our, the developer community today, there's all kinds of additions that are being added to the Temporal project right now that are coming from other users. So like Datadog is a recent example. Uh, there's a number of new uh, contributions and sub-projects, but there, but there are many others. 
Um, it's used in lots of places. So uh, if you look at all of the kind of companies that are <laughs> built on software and have, have a high rate of innovation, um, they, um, uh, they tend to run uh, they tend to run temporal in some some form or fashion, and and our experience is generally once people use temporal, they like to use more of it. Um, okay, so uh, what I would like to leave you with, if, if I've made this exciting enough, you're like, okay, I, I, I buy it, Charles. Now this is going to change everything. Durable execution is going to be a big deal. Um, I want to I want to build a little experience with this. How would I actually adopt this? Um, one of the most important things I want to leave you with is that. Um, you can this this uh, approach to software development is something that you can do incrementally. This is not like some you know elaborate I don't know actor framework or something where you have to buy into it completely or not at all. Um, you can pick one single feature and express that feature as a durable execution. You don't have to change a whole application. You don't have to change a whole service. Um, and the goal is to find, of course, the uh, features that are going to benefit the most from fault tolerance and durability. And I think most of you in your daily life have a good sense for what those might be. And just try implementing one of those this way and see if it doesn't work the way I said. Um, we uh, at Temporal have built all kinds of resources uh, to help you do that. Um, we have uh, uh, clients, uh, SD, you know, SDK clients in uh, four programming languages today, a, a fifth Python is on the way shortly, and we'll continue to add more. Uh, we have samples for a lot of the common uh, patterns that you might want to start with. We have tutorials. Uh, we, uh, you can just go to learn.temporal.io, and we have a whole bunch of resources for you there. We've got all kinds of great uh, uh, talks that you can check out too, of which this is hopefully one. Uh, uh, for uh, And... Um, yeah, that's kind of the main thing I want to leave you with. It's just if you if this is something that you find interesting to explore, um, please go to temporal.io, uh, check out uh, check out the the learning section and uh, and the the download section, and you can be on your way. Okay, and right at forty five minutes. So what I want to do to kind of make this a little more tangible is ask uh, Mayel to uh, do a quick demo. And uh, that'll actually nicely extend the money transfer example that I started with at the beginning. Thanks, Charles. Okay. I'll just do a very short introduction about this demo of the ID. We have like 15 minutes uh, ahead of us. Um, I would like to show you how easy it is to code uh, an application using Temporal. I've, I've had the possibility to choose any kind of uh, language uh, based on the number of SDKs we have available. I chose TypeScript. Uh, one, one of the reasons that TypeScript is not often used for this type of development. Usually you, you use that for web UI, but with Temporal, a TypeScript developer could build a backend application with transactions and distribution uh, execution. So the idea is to stick with this uh, money transfer uh, example because it's quite easy to understand and to extend it uh, to show you the capabilities uh, that we could uh, benefit uh, using temporal. So the idea is like you have a user, the user wants to request a transfer, transferring the money, we withdraw the money, calling a first activity, a first service, and then we make the deposit, calling another activity, another service. But if you want to make this more interesting, let's add some business logic. Let's add uh, a first check. Is the amount over uh, 1,000 euros, for example? If it's over 1,000 euros, should we eventually ask someone, the user, to confirm that he actually wants uh, to do this transfer of money? And this is where we would like add some workflow logic, wait, take a decision, then wait for an external system to send an order. And in this case, it's a confirmation of the transfer. Of course, we want to wait a certain time after 30 seconds, it should expire. And also to show you uh, a little bit further the capabilities about failover or, or failure handling, we could imagine that the withdrawing will fail and see how the platform is behaving and how we could fix the issue and, and resume the process. Okay, so. 
What I'm going to show you is uh, basically a very simple TypeScript application. I'm using a temporal server uh, that I downloaded on the Docker uh, Compose uh, version that we provide on the website. I will skip the client part. It's not the most exciting part, but just to let you know, we have a client that will request a transfer through an API call, send the order to temporal server. We will have also a client application that will later on approve the transfer if the amount is uh, above 1,000 um, euros or whatever the money is in this example. But what's important is more like what's happening in the back end. So the back end, we will have three things, two activities, withdraw and deposit, and the code of the uh, workflow. To do that, we have a worker process. The worker is a piece of code that will subscribe to the temporal server and wait for orders, wait for commands. And the commands will be sent by the client or by other workflows, sent to temporal, and temporal will put in a queue those commands. And by polling, the worker will just get those commands and execute. It will execute either the workflow, execute the activity. We could have more workers. I mean, there are many possibilities to scale, but for this example, to keep it simple, we have just one. Okay, so just the first part, uh, and I will try to be as, I mean, do something as simple as possible so you can follow. Uh, we'll have a question at the end, so let me know if there's anything that you would like me to elaborate. Uh, the first part is just to show you how I call the first step of the workflow. So basically, the client is calling the workflow, the workflow calls the two activities. Okay, so I'm switching and I'm going to try to find a way to code with just one hand. <laughs> but it's okay, I can. This should, be, this should be okay. Sorry for the people on Zoom, which you cannot follow. Um, so in, uh, in that ex uh, example, so I have like a, a, a basic type of uh, application. The first thing which is important is uh, the two activities. So the two activities, as you see here, there are, are mockups, it's just a log, okay? And the two activities uh, have parameters. It's a transfer of money. So what we need for the withdrawal, we need to check uh, what is the account, uh, source account. We need to check the amount. Make it bigger. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, okay, so yeah, command plus. Okay, so two functions, basically, it's what we, we just coded, two functions with parameters. And uh, we are going to imagine that each of the functions is calling a remote service through some API or, or any, any way. Uh, could be an internal system, an external system. Um, I'm going to go on the most interesting part, which is uh, the workflow itself. So what do I need to do for my first workflow? I need to code, of course, a function. A, a workflow is a function, basically. It's taking like, as well, parameters from, a, from account, target account, the amount, and things like that. And I want to call my two uh, activities. So my two activities are declared this way. As a, with a, through a proxy. So this is how behind the scenes going to call temporal server. There's nothing more than that. And then we add some parameters to uh, tell to the server what should be the behaviors. For example, what we want here, we want that each call should not be longer than 50, uh, than 10 seconds. If it's more than 10 seconds, should throw an error. Uh, also in case of issue, then the server we expect it to retry every 50 milliseconds, for example. For the demo, it's nicer, but for, in the real life, of course, we would put more. And we don't have any limit in terms of number of times. So with this means that if I fail in my withdrawal, or if I fail uh, in the deposit, the server will keep trying until something is solved, okay? So let's do the first uh, part of the workflow. So the idea is to do the two first calls. So I call first the withdrawal, Okay, what I need is my 
from a quint ID, I need uh, a reference because it's a, a wiring transfer of money, so we need some traceability. I pass the amount with the parameter of my uh, feature, and, and I'm good. Okay, once I've done the withdrawal, I will do the deposit. Same, but this time it's a two, two account ID, and then again the reference, and then the amount. Okay, what I've done here is that just I wrote my first workflow. So call first step, call second step, like, like presented here, with the behavior uh, which is expected. Okay. So the function, uh, as you see as parameters, this is very important because with Temporal, it's all about calling services and functions through parameters, which, which are going to be stored in the server for the sake of re being able to replay at any time the execution. And then I have my client, uh, just to show you how it looks, uh, we instantiate a client object with a connection, and then I'm sending the, the parameters. So my account, friend account, a uh, uh, randomly generated ID and uh, 25,000 uh, coins uh, for, the, for the transfer. Okay, and then because it's TypeScript, I will start a node. So this is a worker. So this is what's going to start uh, and subscribing to the temporal server and waiting now for instructions. And here I'm starting my first transfer. It's hard coded, so it's supposed to be faster. And looking at uh, what happened in the, on, the, on the worker side, it received the transfer request and then executed the withdraw and the, and the deposit. So I will do that uh, several times just to create some load. And then that's it. So what? is stored and what's happening on the temporal uh, server. So what we see here is that there is a history of what has been executed. So let's say I'm a, a manager, I need to have somebody look into a transaction because there's something fishy, something wrong. And then I can look and I can see that the workflow has been called with a certain input. It has been through a number of steps and there has been the withdrawal and the deposit and and, and, and more and more uh, features. Actually, it was not, yes, it was the right one, is this one. So there are just two steps, withdraw and deposit. Okay, so now I'm going to do something more, more adventurous, I would say. In the code, I will throw an exception. And then I will start again to run a few workflows. I'm starting two of them. Okay, and then what we see, we have the, the log of the, 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 the transfer has been requested, but nothing more has been uh, displayed. So I'm going to take a look at my server. And what do I see? I see the workflows are running. Those are not failed. They are just waiting for completion of the activities. So I pick one of them, and then I have one activity which is pending. So we could imagine like it's a partner service, the API is broken and it's failing. I could check more details. So I know the activity type, I have some habits, some, some features. Uh, what's important to see that the number of attempts, so if I re reload, it will keep increasing. And then there is the idea that of course, the more it waits, it retries, the longer it waits, because of course we don't want to spam uh, or saturate the, the network. Uh, and that's it. So it's like that is going to continue to, uh, to live, uh, to wait. I'm a developer. I've been notified there's something wrong in my service. I'm checking. Okay. There was like a mistake in the code. I fixed that. And because it's TypeScript, it's going to update itself uh, directly. And I'm going to wait a little bit because it's, it's retrying continuously, like forever. It's going to retry. Uh, and, and then, okay, it's resuming. So what's happening is that Temporal has understood that the service has been working, executed the activity again, executed the second activity, and finished the execution. So this is what we 
we want to highlight about how, it, how easy it is to implement those number of retries, how easy it, easy it is as well to fix live production. The, the user never saw an issue. We could resume. Of course, if you have SLS, you could say after five attempts, you just file the workflow and we want to notify the user. This is a typical pattern that we have. And to add some more uh, complexity to the code, uh, or some more intelligence, I'm going back to my workflow code. And then I want to say, okay, so if the amount, so this is a typical business logic that on a uh, workflow, you would have draw something, a, a condition, something like that. This is just code. So we say, if the amount is above 1,000, then uh, tac, tac, up, then it's no longer confirmed. I want to cancel automatically the, and then I want to say, if it's confirmed, then, Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so now I have added business logic, some intelligence to my process. And uh, what's going to happen? Okay, maybe I need to add some nice log. Actually, I have some help here. Okay, so I've, I've been adding some intelligence in the process. So now, if I go again to my example and I start to execute again, okay, it's rejecting automatically. So this is not so, so complicated. And then now we say, okay, we want to have like uh, uh, some business logic. So if it's above 1000, we notify a user or you receive an SMS, please confirm from the SMS is you. Okay, and then what we have implemented with Temporal is the idea of sending what we call a signal. And signal is you invoke a method of the workflow that will change the state of the workflow and let the workflow pursue its execution. Uh, we also have the query where you can ask the workflow for the, its current state. So this is a two different way of interacting. And we are working on and on roadmap on the both, combining the both, what we call uh, um, synchronous updates. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so this one, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I will reuse some code. So to do that, to declare a signal in a, in a workflow in TypeScript, you have to add a handler. And here, what I do with my handler, I say the handler is called confirm, and I'm expecting a response, and my response with update my variable is confirmed. And then it will help me to, to move forward. And then in my code here, I say, okay, if it's above, 1,000, I wanted to wait for the signal to come. So again, I'm going to get my example of code. And this is just, uh, just that, that I need to add. So what do I do? I say, wait until I get a response, which will update uh, my, uh, my variable and move forward and wait for 30 seconds. So for the demo, I will just make it like, 50 seconds, otherwise it's too long, and that's it. So if it's updated, then we move forward, if not, and we fail. Okay, and here again, I'm starting my workflow. Okay. The transfer has been requested, it's waiting. I will just show you how it looks in the UI. So I look at my running workflow, nothing wrong, no error but it's waiting. There's a timer that has been triggered, not triggered, but actually declared, and it will wait for 15 seconds. If I go back to my UI, it's been triggered now and it canceled the, the transfer. So if I refresh here, it's completed with a failure. Not a failure, it's more like a, a rejection. Okay, I'll do again, but now I've sent my signal and because I'm not fast enough, I need to have more than 15 seconds to do this. Okay, updating live because it's TypeScript. 
And then I start my workflow. I look at my logs. So my workflow has an ID. So the way we interact with um, workflows instances is through the IDs. So it helps us to have like some, some dialogue over, over the time and over the execution. And I have this code, which is very simple. It's a client, it's connecting to temporal, passing as a parameter the, the ID and sending the signal confirm with true. And going back to my code, and we'll see if it works. So. Confirm, so the signal, if it doesn't find the workflow, temporary send an error. So you know as a client that there's something wrong. So here it was not wrong, it's been confirmed. And I look at my code and here I have my uh, logic of, uh, it's being confirmed and I pursued the transfer. So of course, 15 minutes is short. I cannot go into more elaborated code, but the idea was to show you in a few line of code. Uh, I insist about the, the little code I've been doing in front of you. Of course, I copy pasted a little bit to, to, to get some, some, some economy of time. But however, just to show you again, in this function, I've added a timer, error handling. Uh, I call distributed transactions. Uh, and uh, a signal, so interaction with the clients uh, over the time. So that's all for, for my demo. I hope it was clear for you just to go back to the diagram. So from that, I did all of this uh, in a few minutes and a few lines of course. Of course, it's a real world and you can discuss with your colleagues who are using Tempora right now. Uh, it's a, those are much more valuable use cases. Uh, I encourage you to to discuss about it. Uh, but this is a, yeah, temporal coding with TypeScript in a, in a nutshell. Thanks, Mayor. Yeah. Are there any questions we can answer? Please. Yeah, it's okay. Put your microphone on there. Yeah, hello, uh, I'm Andre. Um, the question is: the client is working in a continuous pooling to the to the temporal server, or it's a long pull. So okay. essentially, the which has a nice security advantage too. So essentially, the client the worker process opens up a long pull. So the, therefore, the connection is initiated by the client, but it's open, uh, and then it waits for and then the event flow starts from the server. So you, you, it's not like a constant uh, polling; it's like a one long pull. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it's gRPC. This is all happening over gRPC. So I have a question on um, the JVM specifically. So here, like for example, like uh, we can see that the code is being executed by the workflow. Mm -hmm. With JVM, you know, there is a whole lot of things that come. Like for example, the spin up time. For example, we have like Spring applications. So there is like considerable startup time, and other things that need to be initialized. Mm -hmm. So how does that work? Yeah. Like, is it fast or will each workflow have to reinitialize the whole thing and it'll be? Yeah, normally you're not, you're not reinitializing. Normally it's like the process is just up and running all the time. And it's really every function execution that's getting. So it's not like uh, the server is initializing some uh, client uh, each time. It's more like the clients, it's actually like a one-time initialization, this thing called a starter, but that's a whole other thing, but there's a one-time initialization and then every subsequent execution, every subsequent uh, function execution is being driven. Think of like the servers, think of it the opposite way. Um, the server is like, it's more like the, the client, the process is already running and the server is because of the way it's been implemented, it's basically blocked from executing and then it gets unblocked episodically by the server. So, okay. So essentially temporal has a hook into the JVM, but that's already running and it blocks and unblocks. Is that what you're saying? It's, it's not in the JVM. There's a, there's a, a, a SDK. And so really, and really it's the code that interacts with the SDK and the SDK is doing uh, and so the SDK locally to the wherever your process is running, that's the one that's actually doing the blocking and unblocking. It's not the JVM. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, great presentation. Um, well, you mentioned during the presentation that one disruptive uh, innovation was 
this, this language on activities and workflows that enables to decouple a distributed workflow into yes. a, a simple language. So, but if we have these elements, the question is more towards how we test it. Because if these language elements are capturing intention, how does it work with yeah. unit testing? Or I'm, I'm really glad that you asked the question because there was a slide I wanted to incorporate, which sort of, part, it's going to half answer your question and then I'll get you the other half of your answer. The, 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 little C, the, the way I think about the, the uh, programming model is, is these, basically this is five primitives. The main, the main two are workflow and activity. And then Mail mentions most of the other ones. There's signals, there's queries, there's timers. Um, you could technically call a side effect one more, it's debatable. So anyway, there's basically just these things. And the way to think about them is it's more like a way of organizing the business logic you've already got more than it is like some new form of logic of its own. The, um, and the big trick that's really the magic trick under this really what makes this all kind of work is that in the catch, the one thing that is the new kind of burden on the developer, if you will, although really you have this burden anyways, if you think about it, is that anything that's implemented as a workflow needs to be deterministic. And uh, activities, uh, when you call services or when act usually you use activities to interact with services or APIs, they, the services or APIs you call, they don't have to be idempotent, but in a lot of, uh, for certain patterns that you want to implement, they probably should be idempotent. And so really that's what like workflow and activity is really doing is it's saying, put the deterministic stuff over here, put the non-deterministic stuff over there. If you want the non-deterministic stuff to behave in a kind of transactional way, please make it idempotent. If you don't care about that, then you don't have to. And so that's really what's happening is it's more like a means of organization. And so then the SDK, like the, therefore, and on the server side and the SDK, there's all kinds of implementation, the platform that basically treats these executions differently because it knows that what you should do with a deterministic thing is different than what you should do with a non-deterministic thing or not. So that's, that's really what's going on in the covers. Now that still didn't directly answer your question about uh, testability. Um, the, um, the short story is there is a unit test framework, which is comes as part of the platform. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the basic answer. And really we're adding, the things we're adding to testability is not even these days to factor in this distinction, but is really more to support uh, 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 like replay, replay debugging and like more, like more versions of testing where like functional testing where you can like grab event histories, throw them through new implementations, see if anything breaks. Like think about this, right? Like you can do with this approach, you can, you can build a new, like if you think about building a feature today that involves a schema change, right? Think about like how careful it is before those things are staged uh, to production. Um, and in the case of temporal, you could do the equivalent of that, the equivalent of a schema change. It won't look like a schema change. And then before you push it to production, you can siphon off some of the event flow from the actual production system and run it through your, if the code that's on staging and see whether or not it's successful and then push your change. So. The near the, the short the, the, the local answer is there's a unit test framework built in. The 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 uh, higher order answer is that when you get into functional testing, you actually get more test per activity this way versus less. That great question. Thank you. Uh, there was this uh, mention about single point of failure. Yeah. How, how is that achieved? Uh, no single point of failure? Yes. Yeah. Um, let me sure. let me go back to the slide. Um, oh, clicker. Excuse me. Hang on. Yeah. Ah, that's forward. That's right. So let me show you this very simplistic diagram of um, the server. So, um, okay. So if you look at it, so none of these things should be a single point of failure, right? So let's just go through... Uh, uh, each one of them quickly. So workflow workers, activity workers, these are stateless. So you can have um, as many of these as you want. And if one of these processes dies, you just need to, you know, that's on, that's your implementation, not on, on the system. But, you know, coming up with a way where if a worker process dies, bring it up somewhere else. There's plenty of ways to do that. And while that process is dead, the server has held all of the execution. So as soon as the new process comes back up, the event flow goes to that, that revive process and off it goes. So that's kind of how there's no single point of failure on the client side. 
Um, and then the front end service, the history service and the matching service, all these things you see there, these are all part of the temporal server. Each one of these can run uh, 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 a singleton or it can scale out to as far as you wanna scale it out. So we have a version of temporal that's called temporal light, which runs as a single binary in your laptop. And yet, if you look at the temporal that we version of configuration of temporal that we run in our cloud service, it can run on thousands of cores and on 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 uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of of uh, pods. So um, each one of these services, front end, history, and matching, are uh, themselves um, each individually uh, stateless. So if any one of and they and they can shard and what have you. So if any one of these uh, dies. Uh, there's uh, all, each one of these services themselves are fault tolerant. So all the normal kind of survivability you expect from a distributed system is built in, into each one of these services. So there's no master in any of those either, front end history or matching. And then ultimately um, the history of the matching service persists to a database. We support a, a bunch of different flavors of databases. And so that's the only other thing which could be a point of failure. And there, um, uh, uh, we're relying on databases that themselves don't have single points of failure. So that's kind of one way of solving this. And then there's also like a fancier advanced feature where we can actually fail this whole server over to a completely other server that has a similar state. So that's, uh, that's let's say, uh, I think we would say not for production yet, but we can actually, when we, the, the, the um, kind of disaster recovery level of recovery for us is we try to fail the whole server. Then we can, and we can fail the whole server um, uh, again, experimental feature, but we have the beginnings of the ability to fail the whole server across like, to a completely different physical location. So at least on the client side, the responsibilities with the application on the server side, it is generally it's built the server. Built exactly. Every service is fault tolerable, uh, self-healing and, and doesn't have a master, but on the client side, uh, that's, that's your responsibility, but they're stateless. So there's, it's not that complicated. Yeah. And if I might to add on, on top of that, the, the idea is that every event is stored on top of all servers. All the history of execution is saved. So let's say that your workflow worker fails for some reason. You have a good demo online about that. Then when restarting, it will pull again the service, find the command again, because the command has not been removed. And based on the history, we execute the whole workflow, but just getting the result based on the history to resume where it was before. So this is how you can super easily have like a, a failover, like you, you kill a worker, you restart a worker, and you kill again and restart again. So we'll always find the history and re-execute. This is like event sourcing, so that's the way we, we, we do that. Is there a cap on the history? Because let's say if, uh, if a system is being implemented, let's say in Europe, GDPR comes into play. And it, it's fairly possible actually that, you know, some of these, uh, the data that we capture in history, because they are parameterized, right? Yes. So they need to go away. They need to disappear after a certain uh, duration. Yeah, um, there's a button for the shortest answer to that question. Um, the normal, um, so first of all, there, okay, the, the, nor, the, way you, uh, the way people normally handle, uh, uh, um, sorry, trying to think of, I'm, I'm, there's so much complexity implied, but it's, it's a very good question. Okay, let me say this way. The normal way that we would um, handle data residency is that you would actually have uh, a server or, uh, oh, actually, you know, the simplest way you would probably do that if you ran your own server is you would actually uh, potentially just have different, um, for different countries or different places where you need data residency, you could actually have um, multiple uh, namespaces and have a process that could, no, that wouldn't work, sorry. I'm trying to think of the best answer to Sorry, I'm like confusing myself with like the best way to give you. The way we deal with this, um, with data residency with most customers is they wind up having a landscape where they shard their application and there's some portion of their application running in a given country. And then they basically just uh, uh, attach a distinct namespace to that process. And so imagine that you can basically have uh, multiple namespaces that are resident in different countries. And that way you're not violating any data residency uh, requirements. That's sort of the... That's not all of your answer. There's another answer. Like you can also selectively uh, delete uh, events from history, um, which is the other part of it, but you wouldn't necessarily normally do that for data residency reasons. Depending. Depends. Sorry. What, what most of the customer do as well is they encrypt the payload. So there is oh, yeah, no, uh, no payload of, uh, readable in the, in the server. It's just encrypted at the worker side and decrypted at the worker side. So nothing stays there. 
Yeah, so that's super. That's a super interesting uh, piece, which I didn't mention, but um, I didn't talk about the pet. We run a cloud service version of this, uh, of the server side specifically. We don't. We don't run. We don't ask to run anyone's code, but um, you can implement this yourself, or you can do this with our cloud service. Where uh, on the client side, there's this feature called Data Converter. You can do more than one thing with it, but one of the main things you can do is encrypt uh, the event payload that goes to and from the server. And what's neat about it is that is encrypted with. Uh, the client's keys, not with anybody else's keys. So you can do all kinds of interesting things with that. So one, like we have customers that are like banks that use us for money movement, and yet they're using our cloud service, but that's because they know that even if we were hacked, um, you can't read the data because it's their keys that give access. And then some customers will actually give different team, uh, different teams or different clients will run different keys. So they have like an additional level of isolation even within their own organization. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, about the um, uh, infinite retries, what happens if the retries are consuming too many resources or adding too many costs? How will we? Sure. Them? So the, the question was if if um, if the if the retries are consuming too many resources, what are your what are your options? Um, the the retryability is. Um, you have an enormous number of configurable choices as far as how retry works. Um, in fact, there's even on our website, there's even a little um, uh, tool that says, oh, if I make this, this, this retry uh, set of parameter choices, um, what's going to happen? And, and one thing is resources, the other thing is latency, right? Like depending on how things retry, you might add time or not. Um, but the short story, the simple answer would be uh, a default configuration right now is exponential backoff. So it means like you retry a lot and then less and then less and then less and we have kind of a standard algorithm, but that's also modifiable. Like it's all configurable to whatever degree you want. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much for coming. This was really great to have the opportunity to speak with you. Yes, thanks so much.